Open Broadcasting for Non-Use and Consultation to the PTH uh, So please join me in welcoming Melissa. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much as well for your patience. I know I ran a few minutes late, but it's a classic case of working downtown is that everything is always 10 minutes away, and then you realize, oh wait, it's actually 15 minutes away, so you gotta really run to get here. Uh, my name is Yusuf Shah. I spent the last six years working at Hampton Consulting on um, forecasting for land use planning and infrastructure demand. And the, most of the GTAH and the, and the Greater Golden Horseshoe, but we've had a number of projects from across Ontario and across Canada as well. Uh, uh, the presentation will walk through much of how we do our forecasting process and some of the key inputs that we use in that. Uh, I'll ask for a bit of audience participation as I go through this, in that whenever I start talking about technical issues, I have a habit of speaking very quickly. So it becomes very difficult for you to understand. Just raise your hand and ask me to slow down, please. Um, so with that, let's begin. So today's presentation, uh, simple format. I'll give you a quick introduction of essentially what we do at Hampton Consulting. And then I'll start going through our forecasting process. And through that, I'll kind of intersperse that with a bit of where it fits within the regional planning and how our different inputs and outputs kind of affect the story that kind of comes together as we're presenting our results to clients or to different stakeholders. Um, Henson Consulting, uh, it's a very small firm. I'm not sure how many people here know of it, but we're about 16 people. Uh, we work about now 15 minutes away, not 10 minutes away. Um, but we're about 16 professionals in economics, planning, finance, and municipal finance, and um, we mostly focus on two core streams. One is planning and long-range strategy, where we kind of provide forecasting services to mainly public sector clients, uh, as well as growth management, which is where you take the forecasting outputs and you say, okay, we're expecting this much growth to happen. How do we allocate land for, to accommodate all those people and all those jobs? And then there's a bit of economic impact analysis that we also do, which looks at the impacts of major infrastructure investments to local communities. Um, most of our firm is focused on the municipal finance practice. That's where there's a team of about 10 people who kind of look at what long-term financial plans, um, development chart studies, and asset management plans to basically take the outputs from our planning process and say, okay, how do we pay for all of these projects that are coming on screen? And as for myself, uh, just a quick introduction as well, I'm a transportation planner by background. I started working at Hempson six years ago. Um, and before that, I worked kind of on and off in uh, commercial real estate and public policy. Uh, so right now, kind of focused entirely on the forecasting aspect. So before we start, a uh, number of sort of ground truthing on um, what we mean when we say forecasting. There's really three terms that get thrown around based on your familiarity with the process. Uh, a forecast is not a prediction. A prediction is a specific event happening at a specific point in time. So you're saying tomorrow it will rain at 10 p.m. and this is how much it's going to rain. That's more of a prediction. Uh, we try to differentiate it from projection as well. Projection, the way we view it, is more of uh, looking at future trends on the basis of what the historical record has been. So the last week has rained X amount at 10 a.m. Therefore, we can assume tomorrow it will also rain X amount at 10 a.m. And then forecasting is where we start to look at different scenarios for the future. So you have an idea of what the past has been, but where do we go into the future if we start to take into, dip, into account different assumptions? So yesterday, you know, the last week it rained at 10 a.m. X amount, but we know atmospheric pressure is going up, so is that going to change when it rains tomorrow or whether it will rain at all? Um, so that's how we generally look at forecasting versus projections. Um, why forecast? Uh, I don't, I mean, I'm assuming everyone here is mostly in transportation engineering or planning, so that's an important input for the work that you do, but sometimes this question does come up. Uh, from a land use perspective, it's, in, it's a straightforward way to look at how the market might react to certain policy changes. So, assuming you want to increase intensification in an area, would that even work? How would it play out over a long period? So that's where we would step in and say, okay, based on what we know of the local market, uh, here's how things might have to change in order to bring about policy goals that you're trying to achieve. And then on an infrastructure side, really, it's you're building a piece of infrastructure. It's going to take a decade to go through the environmental assessment process, and then you can actually start building it. And that whole period can take 
10 to 20 years, and by that time, the demand inputs might have changed considerably. So that's where you start looking into, for example, what will be the effects of induced demand? Is, are the number of users going to stay the same as they are today? So should we build for today? Or are the users going to change 20 years from now? And so we should be planning for that. So those are really the key parts of it, is number one, looking at who you're building for at a certain time later, and then how would those users react to changes in the policy realm and the market as well. So the one work that we're known most for is the growth, is the growth outlook for the Greater Golden Horseshoe, and those are the quantitative targets that we set that were set for the growth plan. Um, we originally, they were originally set for the upper tier principalities across the GTAH and the Greater Golden Horseshoe, but generally speaking, uh, the quantitative targets set on the basis of the number of people and the number of jobs to be accommodated, and the ultimate goal there is essentially people live somewhere, people work somewhere, we need to provide transportation infrastructure that connects the two groups to, from where people live and where people work. What is the best way to do that? Well, we need to look at roughly where people are going to be living, where are they going to be working, and then how that works within our transportation plans, and how we need to make any changes if we want all these transportation investments to succeed. <coughs> so we will get back to more detail on this later, but this is just a quick introduction of what the numbers essentially look like. See a general trend going up in pretty much every <coughs> municipality in the GTA age, uh, but more growth in the sort of outer the 905 area rather than in Toronto. The components of the forecast are fairly straightforward. Uh, the population growth is up modeled using the core survival method. Um, I'll go into details in a little bit of each of these components, but basically you're looking at how people essentially live and die through a long-term process to get an idea of what the global population is going to be. And then we use what's called the household formation model that looks at how people form households through the forecast period. Uh, and from there, sort of a separate but correlated process is the employment forecast, which looks at the labor force outlook. So you take the population numbers and you say, okay, how many of these people are going to be working, and try to get a sense of where they're going to be working based on another set of inputs and outputs. So this is the base forecast method. Um, we have a much nicer, cleaner, linear graph that we usually present to our clients to not confuse them absolutely, but I decided to give you I'm assuming everyone here is basically an engineer, what it, how messy it actually is in practice. Um, this is the whole process, uh, all the inputs and outputs that go into it on a broad term, uh, but really it's a very circular and recursive process. Um, it's not a sort of quantitative software model where we plug in a bunch of data, press a button, and something comes out. It is a very long process. And if I really had to estimate, a good forecast for one municipality, depending on the size, might take anywhere from four to six months, of which three to four months are just research. That's just us figuring out what's happening today and what's happened in the past before we actually start modeling the effects going into the future. So we'll go through each of these components on the population, the housing, and the employment side over the next few slides. Now, population is arguably kind of the easier aspect of it. Um, the core survival model is pretty straightforward and simple in principle. Um, you really just take who's there today, break it down by age group, and then you apply assumptions about, okay, how many of these people are going to have children, and what is the average lifespan? Look at who's going to be coming into your population base, and who's going to be leaving or dying, for lack of a better word. And then you bring in some assumptions about migration trends, and that's where things can get a little more tricky. But generally speaking, you start with year one, you add fertility, mortality, migration, and add up, add up the inputs, and the output becomes the next year. And you do that re like repetitively over an amount of time to get, to get the year that you're looking at. And so if you look between 2006 and 2016, a clear story really starts to form. In 2006, you had a big, had a big focus within the 40s of people living in the GTH. And then 10 years later, they've mostly kind of gone up. Some people have passed away, some people have moved out, and so what's left is within the, the results, and added to that, new people have been added to the population in the early years as well. So that on its own is fairly simple and straightforward. But then you get into like, setting the individual assumptions, and that can get a little tricky, although most forecasting for 
at least the work that we do, is done within a 20 to 25 year time period. And in that sense, not a lot's going to change on, for example, fertility and mortality. Um, aging is a given. People will age, and so there's an obvious trend pad to follow there. Um, fertility has generally stayed fairly stable over the last few decades, and that's been the case across all the OECD countries. So forget about what the fertility rate is within, say, the city of Toronto or the city of Brampton. It's going to be consistent with Ontario and Canada and pretty much all the OECD. Likewise with the mortality rates, um, not to get too technical, this is one of those definitional issues, but life expectancy generally just means how many more people will live to a later period of their life, uh, not that human body can live to 150, for example. So generally speaking, you see when you look at mortality rates, you're just making assumption of how many people are going to die over a over. And really what you're looking at is with advances in public health uh, and lowering rates of child mortality that more and more people are going to live to later years of their life. And that changes the demographic profile quite a bit. Um, and then there were some talk about being a leveling off where, you know, these rates kind of stay consistent mostly with the mortality rates and, you know, everyone just lives to 80 and then nothing changes. But for the most part, as you can see in the historical record, life expectancy has generally continued to climb over the period. So I think the outlook is fairly confident that people, more and more people will be able to live into later periods of their lives, which does have some uh, implications for public policy. Now migration is really the tricky part when you're trying to do the population forecast, because you're really looking at who's moving in, and that's not a single block of people. There are multiple components to it. There's international migration, which is immigration, and that looks, that's mostly set by the federal government of Canada. So you have a you have a universe of people to look at at any given period, um, and then from there you kind of look at trends within. So interprovincial are people living between the provinces, and there's also some fairly good historical records and stats can to try and build projections on that. And then intraprovincial is people moving within the province, and that also has a fairly good trend line. Most people, at least in the last 20 years, have moved from further up rural areas into the more urbanized areas. So you can kind of assume that going forward for quite a period of time. And from combining all those three together, you get the net migration rate. And that gives you the input into the, into the core survival model of here's the number of people who will have to be added to the population, to the natural base, the fertility and mortality aspect of it. And that gives you your total population. And as I said, migration does have kind of its own dynamic, um, even within a economic region like the GTAH. So this is migration from 2001 to 2014. Sorry, this is a little bit dated. Um, we haven't received, I guess, the more up-to-date numbers on uh, the annual demographic estimates, but this is uh, the latest chart that we had. But you can kind of see very clear results for Toronto versus the 905 and then the rest of the GTAH is Toronto's a location where pretty much only people in 18 to 29 on net move into. And then everyone else, like mostly parents and their children, will usually arrive in Toronto and then move out into the 905. That's been the case for a long time, although that's kind of changing on the immigration aspect because cities like Mississauga, Brampton, and cities within New York region are becoming more hubs for international migration as a people are now going straight to the 905 as opposed to landing in Toronto first. Which just goes back to the arrival cities concept. Now when you're done with your entire core survival modeling, you'll get a really nifty graph that looks a bit like this. This is what we call an age pyramid, um, or historically it's been an age pyramid, uh, but as you can see, the, the bars are today and the line is into the future. The age pyramid becomes more of a age column, uh, and this has goes immediately back to the inputs on people living longer into their lives and for free rates continue to stay low, which means you're going to have fewer net people being born, more people living longer, and so that, that tapering off at the top slows down and the expansion at the bottom also slows down, so you kind of have more of a problem. And this is kind of our overall global population for the GTA age in uh, 2041. So this essentially becomes your main input that you're working with. And from here, you start to do the locational distribution. It's like, okay, this is the total amount of people that are going to be here. Where are they going to live? And where are they going to work? 
that becomes the next few steps in the process. Now this is essentially the structure of the housing forecast. Um, the first part of it is taking the full global regional population and saying, okay, how do people form households? Now, that's a simple definition. Uh, what is household formation? Just means that people leave, for example, their parents' house, go to universities, move into a new house. That's a new household that's been developed. Uh, later in years, two people might divorce, and one goes to a new house, a new household has been formed. So you start to take into account different dynamics like this to try to get a sense of, as all these people move in this global population, what does that look like in housing at a universal sense? And so you start to look at the age structure, the headship rates, which is the age at which people form new households and run through that. Uh, and then you start to break those down into housing life type, which is a bit of an arbitrary rule, but that's how policies develop in the region. You can use any other typology. You can just do low, medium, high density. Uh, you can do ground related versus uh, non ground related units, which is you know, houses versus apartments. Um, but we, I think, historically have used singles, semi detached as one, which are like fixed lower density units, row houses as middle density units, and then apartments as the universe of mid to higher density uh, development. And then you kind of distribute that based on local market demands to say, okay, which city has a market for lower density housing, which city has a market for higher density housing, and that kind of tells you where people are going to be moving over the period, and you get a sense of, okay, what, are, what is the population in Toronto going to be versus Mississauga, for example. Um, and so from there you have your local population base. Uh, and when we start to chart these, we have uh, another nifty little graph used as an indicator, and it's called the fish diagram. Um, this is 2001. It's kind of like way back before the heady days of the growth plan, where we kind of just had your very basic patterns, high density within the Toronto area, and then everyone else moves into low density housing. And so this is what essentially looking at household formation by age group looks like, by type of housing. So you have everyone starting off in higher density or single detached housing, that's where you know younger people are still when they're going to school, living with their family, so that they're in the suburbs, living in a house, and then as they move into later years, they go to universities and the, I'm sorry, it's over here. They go to universities and they move into apartments. Generally within the GTA age, the dynamic has been that most of the universities and student housing has been in higher density areas like downtown Toronto. Uh, and then over the course of their lives, as they go through, and we use the age groups as a proxy, but generally what we're saying is different life stages. So you're in school, you're young, you have a propensity for a certain type of environment, for a certain type of housing. And then as you go through different life stages, maybe getting married, maybe having kids, or having a pet, you need a different type of space to live in. And so you start to switch. And we've generally seen the switch happens around the 30s or the last uh, period where people, more people move into lower density housing rather than higher density. And then that continues through most of their lives when at much later points in their lives when they realize they can't maintain a large house or they've had different uh, events occur in their life, they switch back to higher density housing. Uh, likely to be closer to, I guess, their family or their loved ones or more, they have more medical needs. So this is 2001 and Fast forward to 2006 and you start to see a real effect of how the housing market in the region has started to change. See more and more people start to stay in the higher density of housing. And this kind of starts, uh, this, this follows along with some of the demographic changes is that the big bulge in population uh, is around, I guess, millennials, who are at this time the peak millennial was like early 20s. And so that's when you see a lot of people leaving their households, going to university, and living in higher density areas. So you kind of see that that bulge get a little bit smaller. Uh, and of course, a flip where people move from higher density to lower density housing occurring at a much later period as well. Now normally we would have said, well, this is going to change once people move on through their lives and start forming family, family households. Uh, and we'll go back to the 2001 model, but in 2006, when we also passed the growth plan, and there were some interrelated effects there, uh, number one, we had policy that said, let's try and encourage more people to live in higher density housing. At the same time, there's a lot of changes within the market as well. People prefer to stay in urban areas rather than move out to suburbs. And so, from 2011, the 
fish didn't get bigger, it just stayed small, and the fin got a little bit larger as well. Uh, although 2011 is a little weird because the census changed to the National Household Survey and there were some uh, definitional issues with the data, so I'm not sure I want to hang my hat on that too much. When you go forward to 2016, you really start to see the stark effects. Um, and this is going to be really interesting moving forward because I guess the peak or median millennial generation is getting close to 30. And so historically we would have thought, okay, this is a time when people are going to switch over and start to go more into lower density housing types, but through a number of factors that hasn't yet occurred. And so you see more people uh, staying within their higher density areas, the urban cores as opposed to going out to lower density. Question. I can ask everything for sure. So um, the special region that's represented in this is it the city of Toronto or is it? This is the entire GTA. Uh, and if you look at the city of Toronto, the fish actually gets much smaller because we're not building as many new lower density housing. Most of the city is pretty much built out. Uh, so the focus of housing development within the city of Toronto is higher density housing. So all of these people are mostly within the city of Toronto, whereas all of these people are mostly within uh, the rest of the GTA. And the really interesting part here is actually the end of the period, or the end of the age for things, where we would assume that you know the whole idea of older people deciding that their big houses are too much work for them, they're going to move into a smaller apartment unit, maybe downtown to be closer with their families, but it's looking like people are staying longer and longer. It might just have to do with the fact that you know, uh, generally people are in better health in later years and they can maintain their houses for a lot longer. So. That's a lot of hypotheses. I haven't actually te te or tested any of these. I'm just speculating, but uh, it is interesting to note that the crossover in later years hasn't happened in 2016. And when you start to run through these on a localized basis, you really start to get a sense of what the local housing markets are like for each of these uh, municipalities. So here we break them up by um, Toronto, Peel, York, Durham, Halton, and Hamilton within the GTA age, and we added the Simcoe, Waterloo, and Niagara as well as the major urban area or major population centers outside of the GTA age. But you really get a sense of when you look at when you break down each municipality by its housing typology, like there's a there's a certain kind of character to their housing markets. And Toronto's is obvious, it's built out. There's really not much more low density housing you can really fit into the city, so the focus has been entirely on apartments uh, or higher density housing. And then, as you see in the other municipalities, there's been less housing growth over the period because so much of it is being absorbed within Toronto as opposed to continuing that historical trend towards the 905. And in that sense, you also see the amount of higher density, the share of higher density housing going out as well. Um, and the big one here, I guess, is in York region where I guess Mark and Vaughn are also mostly built out, so you see greater for a preference for higher density housing. So this kind of gives you a sense of you have the global population for the entire region, and then you use the assumptions of housing formation and market trends within uh, the housing or real estate development market. But then we also include in issues of policies to say, okay, assuming these policies play their way through, what would the region look like? And that's essentially where the growth plan forecast came from. Now, historic trends are adjusted based on assumptions, and we go back to the difference between a forecast and a projection, is we're looking at, okay, we take into account historic trends, but then we're also looking at what kind of assumptions do we need to make for the future. So we have historic population growth. There is very little leeway in how much that can generally change. Uh, you can make some broad assumptions about who will have more migration in the future, but generally speaking, you know, people are only going to have so many children, and people will only live so much amount of time, so that doesn't change that much. Um, likewise, household formation and sizes are also going to stay within a fairly narrow band. You can't really change that too much. You know, the housing market is what it is. Different municipalities have different policy goals, and while the growth plan tried to synchronize all the different policies together, there are still going to be some flexibility in there. And then likewise, the housing is quite tight. Um, as much as you know, we all might be urban people who prefer an urban lifestyle and want to stay within a poor urban area, a lot of people do like moving out to the suburbs and having a big house. So you have to kind of take that into consideration as you draw your long-term forecast. But then when we're doing our assumptions, we also look at, okay, what's immediately coming into the future? It's not just a pure modeling exercise. 
we look at development permits and applications, we say, okay, what are people going to be building over the next few years? And this is generally a pretty good proxy um, because of how long it takes to go from submitting an application to actually building a uh, large real estate development. It can take anywhere from five to 10 years. So you start looking at these development applications, you get a pretty good idea of what's going to be coming forward in the next decade or so. Then we look at policy goals and say, okay, here's where a municipality or a regional government wants to go. How far away are we if we start taking into account all of these different applications that are in place? And that delta kind of gives you a space to say, okay, where do we need to adjust our assumptions to meet the policy goals? Is, and how possible is it? So that's where we start to look at market trends and additionally the land supply basis. Because at the end of the day, we are planning for land. We are planning for people, we're planning for houses, we're planning for uh, jobs, but at the end of the day, all of those things consume land. And so you have to make some assumptions about, okay, here's how much land we have, based on what's in the applications, what the policies are, how much of this is going to be used up over the uh, future growth, and then what can we conceivably assume is going to be filled into those plots. So that kind of gives you a sense of what the historical trends are and where you're going to be going forward into the future to some degree, and this is why we limit our forecast generally to 25 to 30 years, because going beyond that, the numbers can start to get a little wobbly. And the end result are not as exciting, but you usually get a fairly straightforward set of figures that say, here's how many people, housing, and jobs you're going to have. And there's other ways to kind of look at those numbers uh, that will go into later, mostly on the employment side, but for population, housing, and people is usually a pretty straightforward metric or units and people. And so this is the result of, I think, the population numbers from the growth plan that we had. You see Toronto start to kind of level off, and largely that has to do with how much you can really fit within the urban fabric of this city, conceivably, within the next 20 to 30 years, and then see some of the regional municipalities picking up because they just have more land supply to be able to accommodate more growth. Now, the employment is a little bit tricky, um, not going into too much detail because there's a it's just a lot of different factors that go into it. Um, but generally speaking, it's a component of population growth as well. Uh, you start to look at, okay, you have a global population amount, how, do, how many of these people are going to be working? And well, that's the first step. And then you start to put in different indicators like participation rates, that's how many people are going to be working. Unemployment rates, how many people are going to be either between jobs and not able to find jobs due to economic conditions. And that in community kind of gives you a sense of, okay, if we're looking at Toronto, how many people actually live and work in Toronto versus how many people just come here for work? And so you start to look at those trends across the region to try to get a sense of what the overall profile is going to be at a certain period. Uh, and then, I mean, there's some, there's some discussion about what the best way is. Some forecasters like to say, well, you know, people move to regions to look for jobs, so we should start with employment first and then decide how that's going to affect population. Uh, we tend to take sort of an interrelated approach, which is, you know, population drives consumer demand. Those are the people that need products and services. So once they move into an area, that might increase the opportunities for new employment to develop. And then that will attract more people to want to come there because of employment opportunities. So they kind of cyclically work on itself. And so that's generally the approach we follow. And then from there, that gives us the regional population as a broad level. And to, similar to the housing forecast method, we take that and we divide it up between the different sub-markets or cities in this case based on how much of different types of employment they can accommodate. And the four types there I'll go into on the next slide, or sorry, later. Um, these are some of the major factors. Uh, at the top of it, on the regional level, we, we do look at you know participation rates, unemployment rates, uh, rates in that community. Uh, but there's also a lot of other things that go into it, uh, especially because the market for employment and economic sectors is a little trickier than the housing market. And so you, you look at different sectors. Um, you know, manufacturing generally hasn't been seeing a lot of job growth, but it's actually been doing really well from an economic output perspective. And so you kind of have to take that into account because, you know, in a classic example, you take those giant logistics centers that Amazon uses to ship goods. They're being built all over the place, but they don't employ a lot of people. So when you're planning for that, you can't simply use uh, employment growth as a proxy. You start to look at 
sectoral and share breakdown. Then you also look at uh, broader global economics, you know, is the world in a recession? So is that going to affect Canada? If it affects Canada, how does it affect you know, Ontario? If it affects Ontario, what is our role in Ontario and how is that going to be affected? So that, that kind of helps you develop the story as you're going through and developing your employment forecast. And then simple land economics, you know, you have a city, seeing a lot of residential growth. Residential growth is higher value than employment uses. Are they going to be able to protect the land that they need for employment uses? If they are, then you work with that. If they can, then it becomes a challenge to say, okay, how much employment growth can you really get if you're giving away your employment lands or your employment lands for residential growth? Uh, and then interconnectivity, uh, the infrastructure that's there, a certain type of employment prefers to be located in different types of infrastructure um, or within specific clusters, so that's where the agglomeration effects start to come in. Uh, and then also, you know, institutional linkages. If you're going to have a university within a uh, city, then that's going to change the profile of the employment uh, within that city as well. Uh, so from here we go to the, sort of the land use types, and this, these are, I think, these are mostly very specific to the GTAH. I think they started being used in the '90s, um, and Hemson, I think, was one of the first people who started moving towards this model. The idea behind this is that we're building or we're planning for land use planning and for infrastructure planning. And so how do we how do we go from using an industry-based model, so like people working in finance, people doing administrative work, people working in healthcare, from what kind of land uses have a propensity for or what kind of employment has a propensity for using transit? What kind of employment has a propensity to need highway access? So we started lump putting different types of employment into different types of uses. So that's where we have these four categories, major office, which is employment in freestanding office buildings, um, generally about minimum 500 uh, people in a building, or 20,000 square meters. The definitions kind of vary here and there. Um, then you have population related. This is retail, service commercial. These generally tend to grow in line with population growth. They're very, very specific to serving people. Uh, and then you have employment land, and this is the more industrial type uses that you may not want to mix with uh, residential development or office development because they do the environmental protection for any number of reasons you want to keep them separate. And then you have the rural, uh, which is mostly primary, so it includes agriculture, but also mining or uh, resource extraction. So when you look at the employment by type, there are very clear markets also within a GTA context. And here I've mostly divided it between Toronto and the 905, but you kind of see Toronto having a very big focus in major office and population related. It's largely because going back to the whole idea of there's just no more new land to develop, well, that means you're going to densify more. And what is the employment aspect of densification? Is the office employment or institutional use? So going through the period, you see more and more people coming to Toronto to work in office buildings or institutional settings. And then within the 905, where there's still plenty of land available to do uh, employment land activities, so logistics uh, and industrial type, you, you'll see a continued growth in that category. And that gives you a sense of, okay, here's the type of jobs that are in different locations. What are their infrastructure needs going to be based on the land uses they're going to be occupying? And the, the added piece of it is sometimes and this is more of a sort of a technical aspect, but when you look at industry reports on different types of employment sectors, they're not necessarily given the number of jobs. So in our case, uh, you know, if you want to know how much office is being developed in Toronto, City of Toronto does do an employment survey that gives us a good proxy. It's, it's fairly reliable, but at the same time, most of the industry reports are done in square footage. And so we have to start taking into account, okay, what is, what is the relationship between the amount of space occupied and the amount of people that are going to be occupying that space? Uh, and this, this has actually become a huge and really interesting topic of discussion, especially when you're looking for high-density employment planning, because historically you've always had, you know, people in an office building work in offices. So you could assume, based on the building code or based on standard designs, here's how much space each person is going to have. But especially in the last 20 years, we've seen a, a shift in moving away from a office model to an open plan model. 
and then beyond an open plan model into more of a collaborative model within these spaces, particularly in the tech industry. And so what you have are building or companies be able to fit far more people into a space than they have historically. So you get projections of, okay, well, we, we, we're not going to need as much space anymore because uh, everyone's going to fit into these tinier spaces. But we, you know, we start looking at the data and we realize, like, number one, it's true. Number two, it's not as happening as quickly as people say it is. So we still have to go to our clients and say, you still need to designate a little more land for office uses than what you know, the industry might be telling you because you know, people are not living and working within these tiny spaces. They still need more space to operate in. So going back sort of as a summary over the uh, employment assumptions, it works the same way as the housing one in, in that sense. You look at population and labor force, or uh, employment trends by the type of uses occupied, and then also absorption trends, which is like the rate at which space and land is being consumed for different employment uses. And that kind of gives you a picture of here's what's happened in the past, and here's roughly what's happening today. But then going forward, you know, employment is of course one of those categories where everyone thinks a lot is going to change, and so you have to start to really pick at those different variables to say, well, what is actually going to change? What is just hype? Uh, and how do we address that? So we do the same thing, look at permits and applications. Likewise, take a very long time to go through the planning process. So you have a pretty good idea what's happening over the next five to 10 years. Look at the policy goals. Some places want far more employment. Some places are just getting it because you know they're located in a good location. Um, and that's where it goes into the market trends. And likewise, how much land is actually there to develop different types of employment uses. And once again, the end result, uh, similar, you get a count of uh, employment. Although the funny thing with Toronto is, uh, it used to be more of a clean upward sloping line with uh, from the original growth plan projections, but the, the employment growth within the city has far outpaced what anyone had originally thought, and I think Toronto's going to hit its 2031 target within the next two or three years. Uh, so you kind of see it flattening at the later end, but then if the other, if the regional policies for the other municipalities work out the way they are designed, then you would start to see more of a focus on the 905 as well. And then there's an additional aspect to it later, which is called land budgeting. And this is where once we go past the forecasting aspect, we say, okay, how do you determine how much land do you get? And there's a fairly simple process, although it ends up being more complicated in practice um, than when you're sitting down to it. But you know, the population side is pretty straightforward. You know, we have policies that say we need to have X amount of people living within urbanized areas, and then X amount of people can go occupy new areas. And this is based on the older version of growth plan. They've increased the intensification rates to 60% in many places. Um, but generally speaking, you will take your population for the city, 40, 40 to 60 percent in the urbanized area, the rest in the greenfield areas, and then from there you make some assumptions about, okay, how many, how many and what type of housing do they occupy, how much land does that need, what kind of community facilities do they need, and then all together, how much land is going to be required uh, to accommodate those houses, and likewise for employment, what can be accommodated within the existing urbanized area, and then what do you need to do that? So, simple, like going back to why I undertake these analyses, um, the key issue is really the effects of the aging population on, uh, on planning and policy. Demographics are going to change over a period, and so what does that mean as we're doing our land use planning? Uh, what you see is, uh, you know, testing the relationship between demographics and different types of work. When we go back to the fish diagram, one of the things that you might find is very similar to the number of people occupying apartments through their lifetime is also the number of people using transit through their lifetime. Um, it's generally going to be a fairly similar graph. Um, and so you start to test, okay, well, will that change? Are we going to see more older people using transit, or will there just be a shift because they can't do all the multiple trips that they need to do uh, within the location that they're not going to be living in? Uh, and then also more on the finance side, but Fewer people paying income tax as a number of retirees starts to surpass the number of people working. Um, and a smaller proportion of people with work-based health plans, so what that means for a public health perspective. But generally, mostly we're looking at 
changes in the physical environment in where and how people live and then where and how they work. That in a nutshell is our entire process. It's open to questions. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Yeah. Um, thanks for the presentation. It was really cool. Um, uh, you touched on this when you were talking about those housing fishes. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering how the lack of full senses in 2011, broadly speaking, affected your analyses, and what do you guys have to change with the lack of information there? Sure. The census was. I think the issue with the census more had to do with employment. The housing was mostly okay, but it had the. The more aggregate you go, so at the regional level, you got a better sense of what was happening, but then once you started going to sub-markets, that's when it started to break down. So for, in that sense, we don't rely only on the census. We also look at other indicators, so CMHC, housing starts and completions, kind of balance the two out to say, okay, what's what's been in the CMHC tables for the last five years, and where should we be today? Compare that to the census and say, okay, what's the difference? Um, likewise, speaking to uh, the planners and getting their building permit information to say, okay, what's been built? When was it built? Should it be showing up in these numbers yet or not? And I mean, I mostly, I guess, kind of talk about this like a quantitative exercise, but it is a heavily qualitative exercise. Well, a lot of our inputs are dependent upon speaking with different policy makers, uh, planners, people, uh, in different divisions. So talking to the water people and saying, okay, when are you expecting capacity to increase in certain areas? Uh, talking to the planners to say, what are you expecting to happen within this secondary plan area, for example? And also, in some cases, just talking to industry representatives to say, where are your clients looking for housing, for example? So you take all of that together and kind of gives you a cohesive picture of what's happening. And in that effort, you kind of start to smooth out inefficiencies within individual data sources as well. So related to the, uh, you think the well, population getting older over time, um, when you speak to clients, are they are they trying to plan for individual staging in place? I guess it's less on the forecasting side, more on what's actually getting older. Like, are they thinking more of walkable communities for nine year olds? Or? Yeah, and that, that is definitely a component of it. We, I guess it's, it's challenging because oftentimes we're part of an entire consulting team, so we'll prepare this analysis. We'll, hand it over to the rest of the teams of the transportation planners, the urban designers, and the policy planners, and then they'll start to play around with those numbers, uh, or I guess those ideas. So we'll be privy to those conversations, but absolutely, they, they'll start to look at it and say, okay, what can we assume within, say, the houses that we're simulating here? And that's if they, you know, I mean, generally, I, we do do this at a municipal level, but then when we're working on the transportation side, we do distill into a traffic zone level. And that's when they start looking at individual neighborhoods to say, okay, what is, is this going to be a neighborhood full of much older people who have different requirements for you know, tra transportation and access needs, and then how do we then address that from the design perspective? So that would feed into the conversation. Well, I guess I'll say thank you very much. All right. <laughs>